Okay, this is Mr. Ridley's GCSE Engineering and we're looking at the this year's exam revision topic which is going to be handheld power tools. Um, this is the sheet that we, or these are the images that we received from the exam board. So the um, cues here are use of technology, manufacturing methods, materials and components. So in this video clip we're going to look at some of those things that we think may come up in the exam and that you need to know about. So the first thing we're going to look at is handheld power tools. I say I'm going to focus here on cordless drills, but a lot of these things are universal to all cordless power drills, uh, cordless tools and handheld power tools. Um, the things that we think may come up in the exam, injection molding, rechargeable batteries, manufacturing methods and materials and components. So we're going to look at some of those over the next few minutes. So first of all, let's just take a look at a basic um, sort of anatomy of a cordless uh, power tools. Most cordless power tools have a, um, a powerful low voltage DC electric motor driving through a gearbox. So the motor is high speed, but the gearbox reduces that to a lower speed, but with higher torque. Um, this particular tool is a drill, and we can see here the chuck, the trigger on off switch, the battery connectors. Most of these have batteries that are interchangeable so they can be charged off the off the tool. Um, the DC motor, I say in the gearbox there. So a common feature of most of these things are lithium ion batteries. These are developed from mobile phone batteries and they are now able to power tools for long periods of time. Now this is something that is a technological advance that um, previous tools didn't have. So. Um, but these batteries now give a long tool life and as they can be interchangeable. The other thing is the small powerful DC motors and these can power tools with lower voltages typically 6 to 18 volts. So these are the two common components of a lot of these tools. Now we're going to look at some of the manufacturing methods. Now one of the ones that you should know for the exam is injection moulding. The outer case of the drill is injection moulded from hips or for higher quality tools, ABS. These cases also have a feature which is called over moulding. And this is where the grips are moulded in here. And this is TPE that's moulded over the uh, ABS or hips to give a, a, a soft grip and to make the tool more comfortable to use and safer to use. Injection moulding is used to make complex shapes such as toys, electronic products, casings and kitchen equipment. The advantages are very complex forms can be produced, high volumes can be produced, things can be mass produced and it can be brightly coloured. The disadvantages of injection moulding are it is expensive to set up, it is a mass production process. So the initial costs are, setup costs are high and some very complex forms have to be made in two parts and then assembled, screwed or glued together. But that is injection moulding. Injection moulding of a thermoplastic, this may come up in the exam, you should know this process. So here's a typical uh, illustration of injection moulding. Plastic granules are fed into a hopper, these can be hips, ABS or other some other plastic. The um, An Archimedean screw turns here, the granules are heated and the screw thread turns to drive the molten plastic in forward it then comes to a highly accurate split steel mould and the plastic is injected into it under pressure. When it is cooled the, the temperature of the mould is controlled so the plastic cooled and the finish item is often quite quickly ejected and there is a there is a just a sectional view of a typical mould that would be an injection mould. There is a in the exam it's possible that they might have this illustration you might have to um, put comments on it. The advantages of injection moulding for cordless uh, for tools, a cordless chainsaw here shows that there are webbing and reinforcements and other details that couldn't be made with another process like vacuum forming. They would not be possible and these add to the strength and rigidity of the mould. There's also um, places for screw threads to be fitted in. So these are all advantages of injection moulding for this particular application. You need to know about thermoplastics. 
Thermoplastics like hips and ABS can be melted and shaped over, over and over. They have good impact resistance. They are good electrical insulators. Thermoplastics are also easily recycled. So that's all information you should know on these materials. So the thermoplastics we can look at just in a bit more detail. We've got high impact polystyrene, often referred to as HIPS. It is a thermoplastic. It's easily recyclable. It's tough, so it doesn't crack easily. It has a high impact strength, so if the tool is dropped, it won't necessarily crack. It's rigid, so it won't flex. It's a good electrical insulator, and it's a available in a wide range of colours. So the colours can be moulded into the plastic so you can have brightly coloured and eye-catching tools. For example, here's a yellow cordless drill case here that is injection moulded from hips. This other product, we look at the second material here, and this is ABS. Now ABS is um, a higher quality material than hips. It has a glossier finish, that's why it's used for things like Lego. Um, again, it's thermoplastic. It is very tough. It is more impact resistant than hips. So things like um, safety helmets there are made from ABS because they're, they're more impact resistant, a very high impact strength. It has a glossy high quality finish, typically better than hips. And again, it's available in a wide range of colours which are very permanent, but it is more expensive than hips. Um, scratch resistant, lightweight and durable are also, and good resistance to chemicals are also other attributes um, that make it useful for handheld power tools. It's easy to clean if it gets other materials on it, it's easy to clean off. Now we're going to look at TPE over molding. Now this is a feature that is a lot of um, a lot of handheld tools. This is done with thermoplastic elastomers known as TPE, sometimes referred as thermoplastic rubbers. As you can see here, the two these are bonded to materials like ABS in a two-part injection molding process. To, these make the, the products comfortable to use and safer to use. And you can see there the detail with some TPE over molding. So that's something that may come up in the exam. Another material that is sometimes used in um, heavy duty power tools, so we've got an um, angle grinder here, is aluminium alloys. Now aluminium alloys and metals are generally more durable than plastics, are often heavier, but not a lot heavier, but they're very durable for heavy duty tools like that. Metals are ductile, that means they can deform by stretching and can be pulled into a wire. They are ma malleable, that is to be bent in directions without cracking. These properties of metals may, be, may appear in the exam. Metals are hard, they don't wear and they resist sc scratching and indentation. Metals are tough, which means that they don't break or shatter when receiving a blow or under sudden shock. And metals are conduct conductors of electricity and heat. Now, if we go back to the um, power tool we looked at, the gearbox, when the tool's under very heavy load, can generate heat, which can be, although the electrical insulate, uh, conductivity isn't a good thing, getting heat out of a gearbox is actually good. So that's one of the reasons that keeps the tool cool. Um, Parts like that made from aluminium or aluminium or alloys would be die cast. And this is a process you should know. It is a mass production process. It gives a very good smooth finish and it produces products that are dimensionally very accurate. So there's a die cast aluminium engine block. Die casting is very similar process to injection molding. The molten metal is injected under pressure into a steel mold. And there again is our die cast angle grinder gear case and you can see that there's very little machining that is um, required. It's, it's die cast very accurately, it doesn't need anything else, it can just be die cast and then assembled. So we're going to look at a couple of metals now and these are ones you should know from the exam. And this, this metal is aluminium. It is a non-ferrous metal. It is lightweight. It is ductile, so it is in easily drawn into wires and stamped into things like the drinks can there. 
it is easily cast. It is a good conductor of electricity and it has good corrosion resistance. But it is relatively expensive compared to steel. There is some of the metal in these tools will be alloys, which is a mixture of at least two elements. It's quite possible that there is an, would be an exam question on alloys. You should know several alloys. Brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. When you mix these two together, the, the characteristics of copper, which is quite soft, and zinc, which is quite soft, and they make something that bronze, which is very hard wearing. So um, alloys are quite important because they're, they um, serve lots of purposes, certainly within the power tools and also generally in the in the exam. Alloys often have properties that are superior to the base metals. So here we see a jet engine, a modern jet engine, which is almost exclusively made from very complex alloys. Inside this jet engine, the parts are heated to temperatures as high as 2000 degrees. This is above the melting point of steel. So if the, the jet engine was made from steel, it would just melt. So it needs to be made from very high, temp, high melting point, very um, tough alloys. Now we're going to look at technological advances of power tools. So over time, advances have improved power tools and made them easier and safer for users. These in include improvements to materials and manufacturing processes. So here we have a, a very old um, power tool and here we have a modern, so that's heavy, it's metal, it has a cord. And here we have a very modern, lightweight um, power tool. Again, you can see the TPE overmolding here to make it a comfortable tool to use. Let's look at some of the other technological advances of power tools. So, they are rechargeable batteries. So, rechargeable batteries now mean that tools are more portable and don't need a power cord. The, the, the capacity of these batteries is increasing, which means the batteries need less charging and can last longer. More powerful low voltage electric motors mean that there's no danger from electric shock. So whereas this tool may work on 240 uh, volts, which may give the user an electric shock here, if you're working on 6 to 18 volts, it's a much safer tool to use. The use of polymers like HIPS and ABS means that tools are lighter and easy to use than all metal tools. Someone's using the tool for a long period of time, it, they don't get tired. And geared chucks um, mean that chuck keys are no longer needed. If you look at most of these drills, they don't have one of these chuck keys. It's just done by hand, which means that it's just this, this component isn't needed anymore. So they are all improvements to tools over time. Many power tools are now powered by rechargeable batteries. These use lithium ion batteries, um, similar to mobile phone batteries. Batteries like these cordless drill batteries can be charged, recharged quickly and they can re be recharged about a thousand times before they need to be replaced. So these are very important to a lot of these tools. But rechargeable batteries contain harmful metals. They should never be thrown away with daily rubbish and they should be returned to the manufacture of a disposable disposal or recycled elsewhere. And most of these things are covered by this, the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive, or the WE Directive, and that is an image that you'll find on these tools. This is something that may come up in the exam. Now, one other thing we need to look at is cordless tool electronics. Typically, in the exam, there will be a question asking some details limited details about electronic circuits. So the exam may ask about electronic components and their symbols, either a charger or a cordless drill. What you need to know really is just these electronic components and symbols. If you know these, these are probably enough to get you through the exam. For the exam, you should be able to recognize these components and their symbols. So we've got capacitor, diode, LED, buzzer, photoresistor, um, battery, resistor, motor, switch, and transistor. So you should be able to recognize the components and know their corresponding symbols. So if you can just, those, especially I, I would imagine motor, may come up in the exam. Lastly, exploded diagrams. These are often used to show the position of parts relative to each other. 
Exploded diagrams are often supplied with products to enable consumers to identify and order parts. So that's what they're used for. That's an exploded diagram. It may also ask you to produce an orthographic drawing of a component, which it might give you a front view or a side view and ask you to add extra views. So that's something else that might come up in the exam. So there's quite a lot to look at here. I would look through this. Make sure if you know this stuff in the exam, you should be um, well on the way to success. So thanks for watching this and good luck in the exam.